What I hope to demonstrate to you today is that someone coming from a university institution in New Zealand, we can be involved in significant research which spans all the way from fundamentals through to broad implications for all buildings and particular inf implications for specific buildings of high importance in New Zealand. And so that's really the title of my presentation, Analysis, trying to understand these fundamentals, re-evaluation, questioning our conventional models in the face of these new observations and our analysis of those observations, and implications in terms of understanding what does this actually mean for buildings and other infrastructure and for, so for society at large. So it may not be surprising for you to understand that the Canterbury earthquakes provided us with some un unprecedented data internationally. Okay? It may be relatively obvious that the Canterbury earthquakes were the most damaging earthquakes in New Zealand since the 1931 Napier earthquake, but actually even on an international stage, the data that's been compiled and collected after the Canterbury earthquakes is internationally leading. Just as one example here, this image shows us the ground motions that were recorded across the Canterbury Plains region during the first earthquake which started at all on the 4th of September 2010 at 4.35 a.m. in the morning. Each one of these different points here that I've got shown on the particular image is the location of what we call a strong motion station, a small box which can basically tell us exactly the, the way the ground shook as a function of space and time. What you can see here is a relatively large density of these ground motion recordings across that whole Canterbury region. And this very large density, about three times that observed in previous earthquakes around the world, has been one of the key ways in which we've been able to really untangle all the different things associated with these earthquakes. Think of it as you're a hospital patient and you've got 100 sensors across your body versus you're in a hospital and you've got 500 sensors across your body. The more different ways that we can sense the way the ground moved, obviously we, the more that we can learn about the particular unique features of that ground shaking. Again, another example showing the ground shaking across the Canterbury region from the 22nd of February 2011 Christchurch earthquake. In this particular case, the location of the earthquake fault, which is shown here, in a white rectangle happened to be extremely close and actually underneath the southeastern portion of the city and it was because of that proximity of the earthquake source itself or the earthquake fault which led to the strongest ground shaking occurring in the urban area of Christchurch during that event. So one of the key ideas was based on this unprecedented data collected during the Canterbury earthquakes, what are some of the new things that we can learn about ground motions? What can we learn about those ground motions that are particular to the Canterbury region, that are particular to possibly other locations in New Zealand, and that are general for all locations around the world? So the first part of the talk is associated with the analysis of these observations that we've had during the Canterbury earthquakes. And a detailed examination of these observations has actually unraveled a series of new phenomena which hadn't been previously observed in a New Zealand context and several of which hadn't been previously observed in a worldwide context. So here's a few lists. I don't want to go into all the details of the list because of time, but I'll focus on three of them in particular. And these three in particular are really chosen to try and emphasize the idea that we get ground shaking on the Earth's surface as a combination of movement on a fault, the way that that movement on the fault causes waves to propagate throughout the Earth, and the way that those waves interact with the very near surface soils underneath our feet. So the first, first of these technically is called forward directivity. We can think of it like a Doppler effect. We all know from high school physics that if an ambulance travels towards you, you hear sound at a different frequency than when the ambulance travels away from you. The reason for that is the fact that the source emitting the noise is moving as the waves are spreading out from that source. And that causes a compaction of waves or actually a spreading of waves. And that changes the frequency. So if we take, for example, that first earthquake I showed you, the 4th of September 2010, the black lines here are representing all the different faults that ruptured during that event, which is a story in itself. You can see here many different faults. They, both, they didn't all break at once. Actually, what happened is this first fault plane broke, and then it caused like a domino effect. So the second one broke here, the third one broke, these two broke, and then finally these two out to the west broke. So earthquakes themselves are extremely complicated. But what we want to understand is that during this process of the earthquake actually occurring, we get this focusing of energy towards the Christchurch urban area as a result of this Doppler effect. 
Okay? The rupture itself is propagating to the east and it's releasing these seismic waves and we're going to get this very strong build-up of energy that suddenly hits the Christchurch region. And anyone that happened to be in Christchurch uh, at 4.35 a.m. that morning would have felt the sudden jolt at the very start of the shaking and that's the result of this Doppler effect associated with the energy. So this image here, which I apologise because, because of the size of the screen, may not be that clear at the back, shows the ground shaking that was recorded during one of these instruments at four different locations in the centre of Christchurch, in the central business district of Christchurch. And I've shown these four images and they're all stacked on top of each other to show exactly the same point in time. And you can see all four of them at the very start show this very large pulse upwards, then downwards, and then some sort of smaller shaking in the aftermath associated with that. That very large pulse at the start of the record is this Doppler effect, this four directed shape. And we can see that it occurred at all four of the different stations associated with it. <coughs> Hang on just a second. Apologies. However, when we take those ground motions and we actually try and understand for those four different records which look to the eye relatively similar, we apply those to a building and understand how did the building actually move. We come up with this image that I've got down here at the bottom, where for those of you that aren't familiar with what's called a response spectra, think down here on the x-axis, this is the height of the building. For example, a value of 1 means a building about 10 storeys tall, a value of 2 a, a building of about 20 storeys tall. And this value on the y-axis here tells us how much forces is that ground shaking producing on that building. And what we actually have is that for two of the records in the central business district, they produced response of a building which was about four times the size of the other records. So why is this the case? Okay, so one of our key questions was trying to understand while qualitatively these four recordings which were extremely close to each other look very similar, actually quantitatively they produce very sig significantly different responses to buildings. And what we actually found was that although the four initial values of that ground shaking were similar, it's actually the way the local soil responds in the top 10 metres below the site which actually governs how strong the building's going to shake. So even though earthquakes occur five, below, five kilometres below the surface and the waves propagate over tens or hundreds of kilometres, that 10 metres below the surface can have a profound impact on the effect on buildings. One of the second things which was particularly pronounced in the Canterbury earthquakes was one instrument located at Heathcote Valley, which for those of you who are familiar with Christchurch is the valley you enter just before you're going to go into the Littleton Tunnel. And this earthquake uh, strong motion instrument was famous because it recorded the largest ever recorded ground shaking in New Zealand, the third largest ever recorded in the world. 2.2 g in the vertical direction. Okay, So twice the acceleration of gravity moving in the upward direction. The key question is, why did we actually see such strong shaking at that station? And we didn't just see strong, staking, strong shaking at that station in one earthquake, we actually saw it consistently, earthquake after earthquake, this location had the strongest shaking every single time. So clearly there has to be something physical that's happening at this particular site. And what we found is actually this unique combination of having here in uh, elevation view the volcanic rocks of Port Hills lying underneath the site and a very shallow layer of soft weathered soil sitting on top of the site. So when we have an earthquake we get seismic waves produced where the earthquake ruptures and they travel up towards the surface from below. And what actually happens is when we reach this point, the interface between the soil and the rock, that causes some transitioning of the waves. Some waves get converted in different directions and different phases and it produces this wave called a diffracted wave which travels actually across the ground surface. So not only do we have waves coming up from directly beneath us, but we actually have the surface wave travelling across the ground itself. And at some point we get a combination of these two waves and we get an amplification and this produces significant amount of shaking. So we were able to observe this throughout the Canterbury earthquakes at this particular site. <coughs> One of the most pronounced things of course with the Canterbury earthquakes was the severe amount of liquefaction associated with uh, sufficial soils in the region. And we actually knew that we were going to have significant liquefaction if we got strong shaking in the Canterbury earthquakes because a combination of extremely shallow water, 
near the ground surface and extremely soft soils. And if we take this image here which showed us the recorded ground shaking in the Canterbury earthquakes and we look at all of the stations located to the east of this wet zone, which we call the region where the groundwater table was less than one metre below the surface, we actually see that all of them showed significant evidence of liquefaction. Now one of the key ideas behind liquefaction, and structural engineers often use this idea, is that if the soil goes to jelly, actually it's going to protect your building because none of the strong shaking can actually be transmitted through the soft soil. Okay, it's a common argument, it's an argument where people would say it's almost like a natural base isolator. Okay? However, what we actually observe in reality, not what we conceptualise, is that when the ground shaking starts, the soil isn't immediately liquefied. Okay? Initially it does have some strength. And so if we look at this image here, one of three that I've sort of highlighted, the ground shaking starts and then we get to about this point here and the soil does liquefy. Okay, at that point, either one of two things will happen. Either the soil is so soft, it'll basically collapse on itself and the ground shaking will stop completely. Or actually, the soil will start to behave like a liquid, but then if you throw a really strong amount of shaking at it, when it moves a large amount in one direction, it actually picks up strength. Because remember, soil is basically different granular particles. Okay, so if we have these particles sitting on top of each other, when we move a little bit, you move down into a gap the soil goes extremely soft, but then you move up on top of the next particle, the soil has to become a lot stiffer again. When that soil becomes stiffer, it can transmit much higher accelerations. And that's what we see here, is actually after it becomes relatively soft, suddenly we get these very large acceleration pulses. And we see that systematically at a large number of stations throughout Christchurch, such as here, and you can see some of these very large acceleration pulses here. What this means is that while liquefiable soils may appear to be soft, sporadically they can transmit very high accelerations all the way to the ground surface, and therefore obviously that can be particularly damaging to structures. So based on some of these critical observations, now what we really want to understand is, so what? What does this actually mean? What can you tell us because of these new fundamental ideas that's actually going to have an impact on the way we design things and the way we conduct life day to day as a society. So one of the ways which we interpret ground motions for the purpose of designing buildings is to make use of ground motion prediction models. And these Canterbury earthquakes actually provided a serendipitous data set to blindly validate a ground motion model that I developed in 2009. So only one year after developing this model, and this model was really developed with a paucity of data at very strong amounts of shaking, we actually had the Canterbury earthquakes and they provided all of these green points here which tell us how strong the ground shook as a function of how far away we were from the earthquake source. So this was a nice blind validation using data which wasn't collected as part of developing the model itself. And this model was subjected to a huge amount of scrutiny. As you can imagine, after the earthquake, that was really the focus of we, we had an earthquake on faults we didn't recognise, we had extremely strong ground shaking, how do we do things better? And so this particular model was scrutinised in detail by the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission, by an expert elicitation panel set up by GNS Science, the government's institute associated with geologic hazards. And on the basis of a lot of uh, backroom conversations which didn't involve me, uh, the model was adopted for use in the seismic design of buildings throughout New Zealand. And so this has an influence on all existing new and uh, new construction and existing construction, as well as the designation of earthquake prone buildings. Because of time, I'll just skip that one slide. <coughs> Another key idea to try and understand how we design buildings for ground shaking is not just the characteristics of the ground shaking itself, but also how many earthquakes are we going to have. And the previous presenter, Cam, talked about the fact that, yes, we don't know exactly when the next earthquake's going to occur, but what we do know is that earthquakes do follow patterns. We have what's called a Gutenberg-Richter law, which tells us, essentially, that if we go from a magnitude 5 to a magnitude 6, we're going to have 10 magnitude 5s for every magnitude 6. For every 10 magnitude 6s, we're going to have a magnitude 7. And so although we can't predict the exact timing and location of earthquakes, we do know in a sort of quantitative or statistical sense the relative frequency of earthquakes. One thing we know for sure is that prior to the 2010 Canterbury earthquakes, 
there had been only one magnitude 4 or greater earthquake in the 20th century. So over a period of 100 years, the Canterbury region and the Canterbury Plains had only one earthquake above magnitude 4. Clearly, the Canterbury earthquakes themselves have changed the landscape in terms of seismic activity. So what we need to understand is, although now the sequence itself has started to die down, has it gone back to as it was and we don't expect another magnitude 4 for 100 years? Or will there still be some residual amount of energy that the Earth is trying to get rid of and how can we understand that? So what this image shows is, as a function of time, we've got here from the year 2000 out to the year 2080, how many earthquakes we have in the Canterbury region. And the figure in the inset here is basically a zoomed in version of the left hand side of this figure, looking from the year 2010 to 2013, and then the number of earthquakes on the axis. So what we have is the blue data here telling us these are the earthquakes that we actually had, in this case above magnitude 4, and then we develop models which tell us what we've observed and therefore what we expect actually going forward into the future. So at this point here we are now uh, September, October 2014. This red curve is basically telling us how we expect the number of earthquakes to change as a function of time. And as you might expect we see this general decay and this general flattening off of the curve telling us the number of earthquakes is reducing. So qualitatively we know we expect that to be the case. The key idea is that millions and millions and billions of dollars are spent associated with earthquake retrofits or design of new buildings. So we actually need to quantitatively get this right. We have to find a balance between designing buildings to be extremely safe but designed to high levels of seismic demand versus designing buildings which are a lot cheaper but maybe have slightly higher risk. Okay, so on to implications in terms of what does this actually mean for the impact on the Canterbury region and New Zealand at large. So the first one was using this new fundamental ideas, these newly developed models to describe how ground shaking occurs and how earthquakes are going to change in the Canterbury region with time. Uh, new estimates of the seismic hazard shown here in red were developed for the Canterbury region. So on the x-axis here, think of this as likelihood or return period and on the y-axis here, some measure of ground shaking. The blue line basically tells us how the ground shaking changes with likelihood prior to the Canterbury earthquakes, so using that old seismicity that I talked about. The green line is something that the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment set up relatively soon after the Canterbury earthquakes. They knew that the seismicity had increased, they didn't have any science to underpin good decisions, so we needed something and this is what MBIE was justifying. This re-evaluation using more detailed analysis has been able to show that actually those values used by MBIE were quite conservative and currently the MBIE values are under uh, revision to come back much more in line with these more up to, uh, up to detailed results. Okay, the same sort of ideas have been used for buildings um, and then finally it's not just about designing new buildings or retrofitting existing buildings, but as you know, one of the key things associated with the Canterbury earthquakes was insurance claims. So for geotechnical engineers, the assessment of how strong the ground shook and how much damage my residential house uh, suffered is a key requirement for insurance companies to decide how much of a payout is this particular dwelling going to receive. Now I've talked a lot about these this famous uh, recording of ground motions throughout the Canterbury region, but even with 50 ground motion recording stations, that's still a lot of space in between where we don't know exactly what the ground shaking was. So one of the methods that I developed here was basically a way to understand how the ground shaking varied across the entire Canterbury region, and this image here is taken from uh, the CERA uh, database, and basically it tells you how strong the ground shaking was in each earthquake on a property by property basis. So now really over 40,000 buildings which have been assessed as TC3 land, land which has poor foundation conditions, they now have specific information about what occurred at their particular building during each of the earthquakes in the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Okay, finally, in addition to these applications which have been used for buildings at large, I've also been involved as an expert consultant on several important particular projects which have really pushed the envelope and rather than just using standard products, they really want to know what is the state of the art in terms of information. These have been major public projects such as 
the redevelopment of the Christchurch hospitals through the CDHB, the $2 billion redevelopment of Littleton Port, and the new Justice and Emergency Services precinct. These are all major public projects, and then also major private projects, particularly projects which want to use uh, base isolation technology. They typically have to have a site-specific hazard assessment. And so two examples of these are the St. Elmo Courts, which was constructed by or designed by Royal Moco Solutions, and the St. George Hospital Rebuild, which was through uh, Powell Fenwick Consultant. So to summarise, this particular project has been highly influential and it's really spanned the full gauntlet from fundamental research through to application for general buildings and specific buildings. It's been recognised as state-of-the-art science through various funding agencies and also through various awards. And as I've mentioned, its findings have been incorporated into the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission, MBIE guidelines and through specific projects uh, through consulting activities. With that, thank you very much for your time.